What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Advancing Man Project. I am Iron Tamer Dave Whitley, and I am so freaking excited today for my guest, Jed Johnson, the mighty diesel crew, Jed Johnson. Um, if you don't know who Jed Johnson is, you probably don't know who I am either because our paths have crossed multiple times over the past 18 or 20 years, something like that. I first ran across Jed stuff online way back in the day when I was first getting interested in um, well, strength in general as a profession, but specifically grip stuff. Jed is a walking encyclopedia of knowledge on how to train various aspects of the grip. Um, anytime I have a technical question about anything to do with, say, grippers or inch dumbbell fat handled or fat dumbbell lifting, thick bar training, any of that kind of stuff, Jed's my first go to person. He's been instrumental in helping me um, understand how to bend steel. And um, along with guys like, you know, Dennis Rogers, Slim the Hammer Man, um, Adam Glass, John Brookfield, Jed's name is on that list of greats for me as far as inspiration, as, as well as being a fantastic coach. I think that one of the things that Jed brings to the table is that he is equally versed as a coach as he is um, as a, an, an athlete. And that is a rare, very, very rare thing in my experience to find anyone who can do both things equally well. So I'm super excited about that. Um, he has the author and creator of literally dozens and dozens of products around strength and grip training, um, nail bending, lifting an inch dumbbell. He has a membership site called the grip authority, which is one of the best resources you can possibly get to most recently. I think Jed, you've been throwing out something about plate curls is the most recent thing that's popped up in my email inbox around that. Yeah, um, I, yeah, that's true. Yep. And um, he was telling me just before I hit record, he's got a big, big North American um, grip sport championship contest coming up this weekend. We're recording this on Tuesday, May 28th. So what will that be? June 1st or something like that. You've got the contest um, looking yeah. at you on the screen. You look healthy. You look strong. You look relaxed. You look like you're, you're coming in on the deload. So um Having said all that, um, let's talk about The Undertaker and Mankind watching the anniversary <laughs> of the Hell in the Cell match. Um, I, I, I'm only partially kidding when I say that. Jed and I have share a mutual love for pro wrestling, and, and many of our conversations have gone down a deep rabbit hole on that. And and truthfully, when I saw that uh, that Taker and Mick Foley sat down to watch the that um, the 25th anniversary of that Hell in the Cell match, you were the first person I thought of, but... Um, so we can go a number of different ways. There's nothing scripted here. Um, that's that's the background story. I am eternally grateful for all the help that uh, that you provided for me over the years, and not the least of which is capturing some video footage of the one and only time that I was able to perform so far at the Arnold Classic back in 2012. You got some some video of me and Dennis Rogers and Mike the Machine up there um that i would have never seen had it not been for you so brother appreciate you being on the show um thank you so much and um what what drew you to grip sport i guess that's as good a place as any to to start is what drew you well, to first, grip first, first. i know you we've, we've talked about wrestling we've talked uh, yeah. i haven't talked about this but i know you you initially started out um 20 plus years ago doing strength training and stuff for baseball if i'm not mistaken baseball athletes yeah. so yeah so catch me up uh, well, first off, I want to say thank you. That was a tremendous uh, introduction, and uh, the respect is is definitely coming right back at you. And um, I'm honored to be on on your show. Uh, yeah, I started out <clears throat> lifting seriously uh, in college. Um, I I quit playing baseball because I absolutely destroyed my arm, and I wanted to be a wrestler, so I started. Uh, training very seriously, consistently five days a week, mostly um, bodybuilding for the most part with some strength training uh, sprinkled in. And then I got into like powerlifting and some of the conjugate methods that Louis Simmons talked about in his West Side training. We, we then moved on to uh, a spurt of Olympic lifting and that eventually turn into strongman training mm. uh so we're looking at uh 2001 for the powerlifting 02 olympic lifting and then 03 the strongman and when we signed up for a strongman there was also 
a grip contest that was being promoted here in Pennsylvania where I live. So I also signed up for that because I knew that grip strength would be very important for strongman. I was really important. I was really interested in following uh, a course uh, for strongman training for like a long time in my career. So I wanted to get as good as I could. So when I saw that that grip competition was scheduled, I signed up for that as well. And and to, and to clarify, been, you're talking about competitive strongman, not performing strongman. Yeah, yeah. In 03, it was I didn't even know what like performing I didn't know people actually did performing strongman. Yeah. I knew there were some feats, but I didn't realize people were still doing that as a professional exhibition type service. But strongman I stuck with until 06, until injuries caught up with me. And then I just stuck with grip the whole rest of the way. And I've done, I think, at least one competition, usually more like four or five per year, ever since 2003. And I put out my first informational product in, I think, 04, 05. And that was grip conditioning. That was training for wrestlers. And then it was the nail bending ebook and a couple grip contests. And then the card tearing ebook. So I put out a bunch of ebooks early on, uh, a few DVDs. And these days it's mostly uh, streaming video products because people don't usually own DVD players anymore. And uh, right now I'm working on an ebook that uh, is about uh, pinching 245s. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and so Tell me a little bit more about the upcoming um, Grip Sport, North American Grip Sport Championships that you're getting ready to go dominate this weekend. Yeah, it's up. It's up in Ottawa, Canada. So the comp uh, excuse me, the promoter's name is Eric Rusain. Not sure if you ever met him, but he's been active at uh, the Arnold before. I don't know if maybe you would have crossed paths with him there. Uh, I know that you were at Nationals in 2017. Of course, he's Canadian, so he wouldn't have been there. But what he uh well he was he was going to run North American Championship in 2020 but with the shutdowns from covid it didn't take place so um you know it was it was his turn to run North Americans we were going to kind of flip flop back and forth so when he uh you know when that layoff of North American North American Championship took place I just started running United States championships every year in June. And now this year we decided that we would have the North Americans in June. And I ran the, or I didn't run it, but uh, I competed in the United States championship in April. So this year we were on in April for nationals, June for North Americans, North Americans is going to be every two years. So I'll run it or someone in the United States will run it in 2026 uh and he's he set up a very eric is great with analysis of the results of contests so he was able to pull from our rankings and developed a very detailed list of qualified athletes for the competition they were all they were all notified um essentially invited and then if they wanted to go if they were available they could sign up and compete so i think there's 36 competitors from uh a little over half i think are from canada and the rest are from the united states and i've also reached out to uh, a person in in mexico to hopefully have mexico involved mm -hmm. in the 2026 iteration of the contest um so it's really the best of the best in grip sport. Uh, a lot of the uh, many of the top names are are going. It's it's really going to be a, an outstanding contest. It's a two day event on June first and second. I'll be live streaming it on the YouTube channel. Uh, day one, there's four events. By memory, I'm going to say it's Silver Bullet, then two and three eighths Napalm's Nightmare. Uh, then I think it is Double Shallow inch pinch and then it's wrist wrench which i know a lot of those names probably don't mean anything to some of your listeners but 
um the 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 four events on the first day would would constitute a very well-rounded grip contest just in day one um mm -hmm. but you got to come back the next day on saturday and we'll do a three by four napalm nightmare pinch uh little big horn and then there's a monstrous just an incredible monstrous medley of i think 40 items you get three minutes to do 40 challenges for the men 30 for the women and a lot of the numbers on the implements for the challenges in the medley are like prs for me so it's it's going to be maybe not prs but they're right up there they're like 90 percent of one rm so in three minutes, the goal will be to lift essentially 40 items that are 90% <laughs> one rep max. So it's going to be very interesting. We're going to separate the men from the boys in, in that medley for sure. That sounds amazing. Um, I believe you're right. I, I, I don't think I've ever talked about grip sport on the show at all. Um, so I believe that you're right that, that, some of the the things that you threw out there as far as the events um i i know what you're talking about but a lot of people that are listening may not know um so would you mind doing just a brief little 30 second description of you know the silver bullet and the napalm nightmare and, and all of those things just so yeah. people can kind of get their head around what uh what you're talking about sure grip sport is uh very <clears throat> similar to a mixture of powerlifting and strongman only the events test strictly the hands and wrists so the silver bullet you take a gripper as heavy as you can perform it with and you set it down put the silver bullet in there and then there's a two and a half kilo plate hanging off of it and you have to hold it for time the um uh the two and three eighths napalm uh, napalm's nightmare is a two-handled uh two-handed implement attached to a loading pin that, and you have to pick it up and lift it six inches and set it down without dropping it the is that double is shallow it, it, is it is it is it a pinch thing it's like a squared off thing or is it round two and three the, nope that would be a round one so it's okay. like it's like gripping two inch dumbbell handles two thomas inch dumbbell okay. handles in each hand, and you're trying to lift as much weight as possible the double shallow inch pinch is like two decks of cards sitting side by side and you have to pinch the decks like this and okay. lift the implement only it's made out of steel but right, the, right. the sizes of the gripping service are about the width of decks of cards and then the wrist the wrist wrench is another thick bar implement and it's like it's it's similar to rolling handles but the twisting action that takes place in the rolling is from straps that go over the edge so when you grip it, the straps are like this, and they're pulling your hand like this. So um, it's it's very very tough. It's the you, you can't get anywhere near what you can do on any other rolling handle on a wrist wrench because of that rotational force. Now um, you've done product on how to do a lot of thick bar training, specifically stuff about the the inch dumbbell. And yeah. anyone who's attempted to lift the inch dumbbell knows that. It's not that it's heavy. It's that when you grab it and go to pick it up, it rolls away from you into the area, yeah. between the, the open spot between your thumb and the rest of your fingers. And so this yeah. wrist wrench that you're talking about amplifies that problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've never actually had my hands on one of those before, but that sounds really fascinating to me. It's a really good training method. It was, uh, it was invented by a guy named Mike Cochran, who was uh, an arm wrestler. And he, he shut his uh, company down and uh, uh, Luke Raymond took over at Arm hmm. Assassin. And now he sells it. Um, anything else you wanted to talk about there? No, I just, uh, that was, uh, uh, people who aren't familiar with it, I wanted to to give kind of the overview about it. But um, yep. yeah, it's, yeah, day uh, two, day two has the, the three by four napalm pinch. So the handles will be taken off the napalm nightmare frame and then replaced with three by four blocks. And these will, these spin also, uh, it's kind of like a three by four Saxon bar lift, only you're okay. able to attach it to a pin. And uh, then the second event, the second event is little big horn. Uh, that's a, that's an implement sold by iron mind and it's a cone shape. It replicates lifting an anvil. And then uh, the med. So the, 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 
the little big horn is is an implement that attaches to a loading pin and it's uh it's a tapered vertical bar deadlift right right yeah mm -hmm. i've never used one of those either but that's cool it's very specialized um i'm not sure how much it carries over to anything besides like other cone lifts and you know get you ready to lift some anvils but even anvil lifting is different from the little big horns so in grip sport most of our lifts are only done to six inches so you're you're you're, you're exhibiting control over the lift because calling lockout is virtually impossible in grip uh without bracing the implement against your your leg it's it's almost impossible so we we did away with lockout lifts a long time ago um there's still some holdovers uh because it, it just kind of looks weird to do like axle deadlift to a six inch lift Mm -hmm. But um, every, everything else is pretty much either six inches, seven and a half inches, or 13 inches. It depends on who invented the, the piece and what they assign the rules to. So it can be a little confusing, but anything like that, I'm, I'm, I just serve as a resource to straighten all that out with, with promoters and competitors. That's really cool. I had um, James Fuller from Strongman Archaeology on the show a few weeks ago, and, you know, he's deep, deep into the – USAWA and all around weightlifting yeah. and that sort of stuff. And so it was fascinating conversation with him, much like this is because I, I know what I know. And I also know there's a bunch of stuff that I don't know. So when I talk to someone like him or someone like yourself, and you're talking about these various things that, that I've heard of or maybe seen, but never attempted before it, it reminds me of the depth of dedication that the athletes who compete in that stuff have to, to, to come up with these, these, these lifts, to come up with these movements and um, just, it's fascinating stuff to me. And so um, very educational for me. And like I told you before we started recording, the whole purpose for me in this podcast is to either to be able to get to talk to people that, uh, that I know and love and respect like yourself or people that I might not ever have another chance to talk to. So um, yeah. I appreciate you bringing that into the mix. Um, if yeah, and what's someone... interesting is you mentioned James Fuller and his uh, Usawa history if I'm not mistaken, the British wing of that is where grip sport came from because oh. David Horn in, in uh, the UK used to compete in those all around lifting federations. Mm -hmm. He, he kind of used that as inspiration for formulating the sport of grip. Mm. And then he put information out and then we started running contests at diesel crew here in the United States. And it's kind of grown from there. So really the roots of our organization come from the very same organization that James Fuller uh, competes in. James, James is a great guy. He's been yeah. to my house at least two or three times and we're, we're working on setting up a trip for him to come down again to the gym. He hasn't been down here since I've owned the gym. That's awesome. Um, I would, I, I hope you have cameras rolling when you guys get together and start doing stuff because. Oh yeah. Uh, because conversations that I've had with him and obviously conversations I've had with you, um, it, it's, it's almost always one of those things that, that it's so enlightening to get with someone who has the the level of knowledge and, and the depth of knowledge that someone like yourself has, um, to, to just kind of start thinking out loud and almost go stream of consciousness with it and, and talk history and talk technique and talk, leverages and and all the stuff that goes along with that so i can see the two of you guys getting together being very much one of those conversations where if i was there i would just be standing there listening and and you know going back and forth so i hope you run the cameras and i hope that you get a lot of good footage oh, yeah. out of it. that'll be fantastic yeah um definitely planned for sure on the subject of grip sport mm -hmm. if someone contacted me and and this has happened before and they're like i want to get into grip sport or i want to learn more about closing grippers or or something that's more specific to grip sport than the kind of um, grip training that I do. I always send them your direction. Um, obviously you have Thanks. the grip, the grip authority.com is the, the membership site that is, how long has that been running? Like 15, 20 years that you, that you've had that up and running. I started that in uh, uh, 2010, January of 2010. Yeah. So almost, so 14 years and some change. And, yep. and there is a, it is an encyclopedia of good training information. And, and I don't, I don't throw out 
terms like that lightly. That, that is an absolutely a phenomenal resource for anybody. And it's affordable too. Um, but beyond that, if someone wanted to get involved in grip sport, where if, if someone like contacted me today and said, Hey Dave, I want to know about grip sport. Where should I go to learn about grip sport? Obviously I would send them to you, but more specifically than that, um, websites, seminars coming up, anything like that. Yeah, I actually have a big seminar that's taking place on June 29th here in my gym in Wyluston, Pennsylvania. And we're going to go all day and it's going to be partial lecture, uh, but the majority of it is going to be uh, hands-on training. So the the thing that I've seen the most over the years is that uh, newer people to the sport really suffer uh, with their technique. So their performance suffers because of their technique so mm -hmm. i want to iron out some of the some of the wrinkles in their technique while they're here and uh give them an opportunity to start seeing some better results because on on anything uh any kind of a lift as you know uh if your technique is bad it's it doesn't matter the drills you do the weights you use the sets and reps it doesn't matter you're not going to be able to improve by any significant amount until you iron out that technique. So right. that's, that's going to be the, the first and foremost objective at that grip sports seminar. Uh, uh -huh. Beyond that, I also have thousands of videos on, on YouTube. that are completely free. And so what I would suggest is if someone wants to learn about gripper training, block weights, inch dumbbell, just put in Jed Johnson blob, Jed Johnson inch dumbbell and the search results will populate with a multitude of my videos. And then if you want to go further and learn specific information uh, in detail about those lifts, then just check out the description box because there's pretty much always a link to some kind of resource that you can get to study further in that subject. If someone wants to um, register for your grip sports seminar, where do they need to go online? Go to dieselcrew.com slash store slash shop. Dieselcrew.com slash store slash shop. And then just uh look up grip sport seminar and it's down there. Okay. I'm gonna make I'm asking that because I wanna obviously make sure to put that in the show notes. So anybody yep. that wants to to get started on that can can get started on it. Right now I think I've got uh I've got four people signed up, but as always, right, right, you know, towards the people wait till the end, right? I've gotten two people that have said they're going to sign up this week. So that's six. So that only leaves four open spots. I'm only taking 10 people because I want to get people through a ton of implements at this seminar. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, I, I noticed too, you've got a, a new strict curl program that, uh, that you just came out with. Um, yeah, you, I, um, so I, I got, I, um, go ahead, go ahead. I got into strict curl big time in like 2021 or 2022. I, I was really interested in it. And I, I, no, it was actually before that. It was 2020. I did my first competition. 2021, I did my second competition. And then uh, in 2022, I ran my own competition. So it's, it's been an interest of mine for a really, really long time. Even all the way back to like 2014, 2015, there were online challenges for strict curl. Uh, and, um, I've always been really interested in, uh, arm training. So, uh, I, I, in like 2022, I started writing a strict curl program and I'm a fantastic starter. I'm a terrible finisher. So I kind of got away, got away from it, started working on something else. And I just came back to it and I realized that my programming and my approach to training has changed so much. I basically had to rewrite the whole program. Because I, I didn't feel right putting it out how it was because that's not even how I train anymore. And that's not how I suggest people train. So that took a little bit longer to complete the the ebook. But I'm really happy with how it turned out. It's uh, just by doing, just by like starting with, with week one of my own programming, I've already set two new PRs. Nice. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's based after the conjugate system. Mm. So max effort days, dynamic effort days, and plenty of uh, repetition effort, as well as 
uh, cycling in different bars and uh, incorporating the use of bands. That's awesome. Um, I think that's one of the things that fascinates me about the the work that you do is you you draw heavily from Louis Simmons and the conjugate method and all that stuff. And I'm I, I'm I know a little bit about it, but not enough to even talk about it intelligently. Like most of my programming knowledge comes from more of a of a Marty Gallagher periodization type approach that way too and i think both are valid both have produced champions all over the place um but it's always fascinating to me to hear you start talking about that sort of stuff um and on the subject of strict curls i didn't know that the strict curl was a contested lift until i got on tiktok back in probably 2018 i got in um our mutual friend tim fox reached out to me and said hey are you on tiktok i'm like i don't even know what the hell that is he said, it's this new social yeah. media platform. I signed on or, or started an account uh, like a month ago and I've got like 10,000 followers already. And it's great. So I went in and did the thing and, and my TikTok blew up really quickly to a couple hundred thousand followers. And then it kind of tapered off after that. And I'm just on there doing feats of strength, nail drives and, and, and all that sort of stuff. But one of the people that I wound up meeting virtually on TikTok is um uh, the juggernaut big Wyatt Lozano and mm -hmm. He's and good guy. Yep. yeah and and he is an amazing human being and and truly one of the like he's he's like in the Bud Jeffries class of of this just doesn't make sense he's so strong and particularly with with what he does you know with the with the curls and all that so I was really pleased a couple of years ago when I saw that you and he had had crossed paths and that you're talking about curl and all that sort of stuff um so yeah uh did, did you have you like shot any video with him have you gotten together and uh and and trained together no unfortunately no uh we've talked about it uh i tracked him down on instagram and we've messaged several times and uh you know we've tagged each other and stuff uh but we every every time i had an open weekend he was busy and vice versa but i got to watch him compete in 2022 at the arnold classic and yeah. uh you know, he, he curled something extraordinary that day and I, I captured it on my camera, on my phone and uploaded it to my channel. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's awesome. He's like the, the strongest, uh, or the heaviest drug free strict curl yeah. ever completed at that time. So, and I'm sure he's probably well beyond what he was doing in 22 now. Yeah. He's an awesome dude. And it's, it's interesting to me too. He's one of the guys, um, and, that like most guys that I know that are truly strong, um, no matter who puts something on social media, if they can be a complete beginner, you know, a little skinny kid or, or someone who's a hundred pounds overweight, that's, that's working to, to get their health in check and stuff like that. He's one of those guys that every time I see him pop up in a comment section, he's always saying something encouraging. He's always saying something uplifting. And um, the, the haters that, that come in and say stuff like that because I'm, I'm sure that you've had your share of those on Instagram and various other places as well. They're always the people who don't have any content. They don't have any, any pedigree. They don't have anything at all going on like that. They just want to go on and, and try to bring some heat on somebody. But um, Wyatt was, was one of those guys. I posted something. I don't remember what it was years ago when I first got involved on TikTok, and it was, it was whatever it was, was particularly juicy to the haters. And I was getting a lot of, a lot of um, heat that way, which I don't ever take personally. And I'm like, this just means that my video is getting engagement and it's good for the algorithm. So I'll actually go in and, and engage with the, the haters, you know, just to get the, the video yep. going out there. But he popped in. I don't remember what he said exactly, but it was, it was super cool that he did that. And um, I'm like, I don't know this guy. He's clearly very strong and he's, he's not just strong at, at lifting heavy things, but he's, he, he's got a good heart too. So that uh, I, I, happy to have added him onto my list of, of strong friends that way. Um, yeah. And you, you speak about TikTok. TikTok. I don't, I don't have a TikTok, but people have sent me your videos. Hey, look at this guy. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm real good friends with him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Tim, Tim Fox also reached out to me around that time that he reached out to you and told me to get on there. And I was like, eh, I, I have a hard time, hard enough time keeping up with what I already got. So yeah, I never ended yeah I feel you on that one. Um, so yeah, going back to wrestling, um, did you watch the uh, the Undertaker Mick Foley thing? Were they? Were no. they 
It's, I didn't see that. No, it, it's. I'm sure it's, it was good. Both those guys are are excellent talkers. Yeah, you know they don't. It's not like you're trying to pull words out of those guys. Those are those guys are good talkers, especially. It's especially surprising to hear Undertaker converse the way he does because throughout most of his career, he barely said anything. Right. Uh, uh, you know, Mick Foley is obviously very prolific when it comes to wordsmithing. He's written, I think, three different books or something mm-hmm. like that and come out with lots of material. So I, I'm sure it was enjoyable. When you get about a half an hour, um, find it on YouTube. It's the two of them. They just they got together at, I don't know if it was someone's house or at a hotel or whatever but um they got together and they pulled up the the hell in the cell match that they did it was like the 25th anniversary of it and they talk through the whole match and they talk about some of the behind the scenes stuff and it's it's really cool to hear the guys who were doing that match tell the story behind the story because you know any good wrestling match tells a story and for them to, to talk that story um like like for instance did you know that um when Foley goes through the top of the the cage and the cage collapses on him, that that was a shoot. That yeah. wasn't supposed to happen. Um, right. The uh, the the zip ties got messed up, and they both talk about how they're up there on top of the the thing, and they as they're going into that little spot with the choke slam or whatever it is, they can hear the zip ties going pop 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 pop, and but they're committed at that point, right? And that's after he's already gone off off the top and through the desk. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and then uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Terry Funk comes out and like he wasn't even necessarily supposed to come out during that match, but they didn't know what the hell was going on, so Funk comes out and uh, checks on him, and I guess there's some communication between Funk and Undertaker, and <laughs> Undertaker yeah. choke slams him or something, and his shoe shoe flies off. So yeah. <laughs> uh, apparently his shoes weren't even tied that tight. He wasn't supposed to go out there. Yeah. Um, and then what a lot of people forget is that Foley was involved in a match later on that night. So after all of that chaos, after falling, you know, 15 feet and then 10 feet, he has to go out and do a run in, in a later, in a later match. Yeah. So it's like, it's just like, how, how is anybody able to withstand that kind of punishment and just keep on going? But that dude was just able to, tolerate so much so much trauma it's it's unbelievable yeah it's it's funny too they talk of um undertaker talks about how distracted he was when foley finally gets back up on top of the cage because um he's like looking at him and he's like dude you've got a booger on your face you know like this is like, but what it was was his tooth that had punctured through his <laughs> lip and was just sticking yeah. out under his nose and he said that was like so distracting to him to work that match and i'm like yeah yeah it was a great match i remember i watched that live yeah, I, when it happened i can't remember if i did or not i that was what year was that 98 98 yeah so i would have been in college and there there were periods when i was so busy with baseball and having to study because my first my first semester or my second semester i had to make up for my first semester because i screwed up and i took one of my classes was only a one credit course. So I only had 13 credits and you're supposed to have like 15 or 16. Mm-hmm. So I was like working from behind. So there was a lot of time where I, I had to miss a bunch of wrestling, uh, a lot of NWO stuff, a lot of the Undertaker, Mick Foley, Kane stuff. Uh, all the, I, I missed a lot of that stuff with like the, um, you know, really all that stuff in that time period. I, I, I don't think I saw a lot of that live. And then once once things started slowing down, I was able to tune into the pay per views again. We used we used to buy every pay per view, every yeah. WCW and uh, WCW and WWF pay per view. We we bought, taped them, and I have them in my catalog. Yeah, um, that was around the time that I was actually in the ring working with. Uh, That's cool. With Jeff the Crippler Daniels, and and we would get together every pay per view at his house, and a bunch of the boys would come over, and we'd sit and watch them and stuff. Um, didn't you but, say your ring name was uh, Morbius or something, and you were a vampire or something like that? That was that was one of the gimmicks I did. It was Morbus, and I had, uh, um, like flaming red and yellow contact lenses that I wore. My hair was long at the time, and I got some like theatrical quality um, fangs that were like prosthetics that you know you you would take this this goop and melt it kind of like when remember in, in, in football, when you would like put your mouthpiece in the hot water and it would get all 
yeah all pliable and you put it in and drink yes. and burn your mouth with it so i had yeah that with your like gums just, would be, be on fire yes yeah yeah and so so i had i had um you know theatrical grade prosthetic fangs and um um i would i would put makeup on because that was around the um interview with the vampire movie time and so i kind of modeled that look and i would wear like a big fluffy shirt and everything you know and i would put on makeup that made me pale and i would draw little blue veins on and then the hard part awesome. about that was um th that that makeup would immediately come off as soon as you locked up with somebody so what, what we started doing is i would spray this acrylic stuff on my face so the makeup wouldn't come off so but i couldn't sweat on my face either so it was really pretty pretty miserable gimmick to to do to make you know 35 bucks in one night but it was fun I had a great time you know um, did, did you know that i that i went to a school in 2015 and uh it was kind of like a fishing expedition to possibly join the school did i ever tell you that in 2015 no i didn't know that i, I know that you yeah. had you had um uh, maybe you did tell me that i i i for some reason i thought that you had had uh entertained going to the power plant in atlanta or something like would it, it am i just getting those two things mixed right. up uh i what you might be thinking of is i sent a tape into tough enough uh, during it. my senior year of college that's it um but i found out that this whole time so i live in wylusing pennsylvania scranton pennsylvania is only an hour and 15 minutes away and for for 20 25 years there was bone breakers academy in scranton and if i would have known that in right out of college, I would have gone right there and trained to become a wrestler. Sure. I think prior to that, it was a wild Samoans Academy. Uh, I could be wrong, but for some reason I'm thinking that might be true. But anyway, in 2015, I found out about this and I went down, uh, the trainer's name, the head guy was, uh, Justin glory. And, uh, he, you know, he sat down with me, he talked to me about it and I, I was asking questions and I didn't end up going because I think a week later I had to get my sinuses scraped. And they told me that if I got hit in the nose at all, I could potentially die within like six weeks after the surgery. So I didn't end up going. Um, but man, things, things would have been really different, dude. If I would have known about that when, when I just first got out of college, dude, I, I, I definitely would have made that trip multiple days a week to, to see what I could have made of myself at uh 23, 24 years old. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of parallels between the wrestling business and the music business. You know, there's, there's, it's night after night after night for the, the guys yes. that are, that are, that are doing it. It's work, 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 work for little or no money for a very long time. Yeah. And then if, if you do, get your shot you 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 can wind up being stone cold or you know any of those guys or you can wind up being um the character that mickey rourke played in the wrestler which yeah. um mm -hmm. which I, I don't know did you ever get in a ring did you ever like actually work no no i didn't right. uh they did mm -hmm. offer me uh to be like a a second and walk down the aisle and like just kind of stare at everybody yeah. because what, what what a lot of people don't realize at least in this group i i was taller than ever so I, I i had the meeting with justin glory and then he had a workout for about two hours and he put the guys through drills and stuff i was taller than every single person that was in that ring there was not one guy that was that was my height so um, I had that advantage and he, he thought I could do well, just, I wouldn't even had to do anything. I wouldn't have had to push anybody, touch anyone, just walk down the ring and come back. But I had, I already had something going on. Right. So I, I couldn't, it was like a family thing. So yeah, I, I couldn't do it, but, uh, no, I never, I never got in the ring. I never, never ended up doing it. I I'm sure it would, would have been 30 seconds. I would have been all blown up and I would have been in a heap on the, on the concrete. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, the uh, the locker room scenes in that uh, that Mickey Rourke movie were so spot on from my experience bet, because yeah. because at that level, which is the level I was at, you have the guys who want to do it that are just getting into it, and then you have the guys that have had their run and they don't know what else to do. 
And and those are the guys that are in the locker room. So when the when the old timers come in, all of the younger guys are just super respectful and 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 very much like that. Um, so it was a very accurate description. Did you ever know a guy named Gypsy Joe? Did you ever see him? Do you know who who, who he was? I'm not sure right now. I can't say I have. Um, the, the one time that I got to meet Mick Foley, he was doing a, like an in-store, uh, meet and greet thing. And I was, was just on fire for the business. And there was a place that we used to work every Thursday night in Shelbyville, Tennessee called the cab company. And it was an old, um, you know, taxi cab company that the garage area and the storage where they would park all the cars and stuff had been converted this big open space, they set a ring up in it and all that sort of stuff. Um, Tim Fox used to work there too. Tim Fox is actually mm-hmm. from, you know, we're, we're about an hour um, away from each other. And, okay. and, and Tim used to wrestle too. And so when I got to meet um, Foley that time, I get my little picture and then, you know, you, you can choose, you could choose a picture of mankind, dude, love or cactus. Right. And so I picked cactus of course. And so I go up and I get yeah. to, to get my, uh, my autograph and and all of that stuff and um i said some some you know fanboy stuff to him and told him that i had just gotten into the business and he's like oh you're here local and i'm like yeah and he says um do you ever work the cab company and i'm like dang he's worked the cab company I'm like yeah and he says um this is gypsy joe still working down there and i'm like yes yes at the time this was you know 25 years ago joe was probably in his late sixties then he's gone now, but he was, he was in it when it was still traveling carnival stuff. He, he immigrated to the States from Romania and, Mm -hmm. and he played this whole gypsy angle. His English wasn't very good. So whenever it would be uh, a spot on the mic, the announcer would, would ask something and he would either say yes or no, but he would like, you know, really back it up with, with the physicality. And Mm -hmm. um, Foley says, next time you see Joe, tell him that tell him that uh cactus said hi and i said i'll do it and he looks me dead in the eye and he says people say that i'm a hardcore legend people say that terry funk's a hardcore legend gypsy joe is the hardcore legend and like like if you work joe and you didn't work stiff he'd get mad at you if 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 uh if anybody was going to get color he 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 had to do it old school like if he was going to bleed he wanted you to like take the chair shot and and like really yeah. deliver it, sink it in there. I'm like, he was, mm-hmm. he started, he would train people just on a piece of plywood, taking bumps with no ring, nothing like that. Just go take bumps. So he was, uh, he was a legend truly. Um, and I had no idea this conversation was going to go to that, but, but it's pretty cool. Um, well, that's, that's really, yeah, that is really cool. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's, if, if I have any regrets and I, I can't, it's not a regret. I don't know what the word is, but it it would have been cool to do at least like one match. Yeah. You know, just to say I did it. Yeah. At this point, it, it's nothing that, you know, bothers me or right, anything right. like that. I was, I was very disappointed when I found out there was a wrestling school clo- so close by though. That right. Was, that was, too, that too was little, too late. Yeah. 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 Um, well, the last thing I want to do, and I, I didn't forewarn you, um, that this was coming, but the last thing I want to do, I like to end these, talks with um rapid fire questions so i'll just fire one off you answer it i've got a few here and um we'll just go from there and we'll wrap it up um before we do that though anybody wants to find you they just search you on the various social media outlets um and the grip authority.com jed johnson um on instagram and and facebook and YouTube. youtube and all that sort of stuff yeah youtube's probably the best place to find it And like jed said earlier it is a it his YouTube channel is an, a free encyclopedia, um, and and I've been a member of the Grip Authority for it, probably 12, 13 years at least, and the information that's in there is even better than what he gives away for free. So um, go check it out if you're interested in, in improving your grip in any aspect whatsoever. Um, all right, going on to rapid-fire questions before we, uh, before we wrap it up. What is one useless talent that you have? juggling very cool um what's the most valuable? i'm terrible at it but i can do it like I, it passes for legal juggling i think but it's i'm no good cool cool what's the most valuable piece of advice you've ever received um listen to people that know more 
than you. And what's the worst piece of advice you've ever received? Um, I don't even know. I'm not. I don't. Uh, <laughs> it it's okay to speed if there's if it's only five miles over over the speed limit. That is terrible advice. Yeah, because that you'll is, still get. Yeah, because you'll still get the ticket. Yeah. That. <laughs> What's your favorite holiday? Uh, Halloween. Mm, very cool. Any particular reason? What is it about Halloween? Uh, always like dressing up, and I love going to haunted houses. Fun stuff. And it's less expensive than Christmas. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> David Lee Roth or Sammy Hagar? David Lee Roth. My man. Um, and finally, if the, you could only eat one thing for the rest of your life, what would you have? Chinese food. Chinese food? Chinese food. I did not know that about you. Yeah. I'm I'm a little surprised by that. But uh Yeah, I, it's my you know, they put a Chinese place in when I was in high school. It was I think it was before I had a driver's license. So it was probably like 1995 or something like that. 19 whatever, 94, 95. And, uh, ended up going there and it was like for, for $5 and 50 cents, you could eat as much as you could. I knew that after 20 minutes, the, like the smell begins a process where you're going to be filled, filled up after 20 minutes. So I had to get in there and get as much in me in 20 minutes. Cause after that, I would feel sick if I ate more. So I have like a whole system, dude, I have a whole system established and I'm able to maximize my investment every time i'm in there that's and that that's that's really good for um for any sort of bulk cycle that you're doing too i that uh that 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 20 minute window it makes me think of uh yeah i remember who was it was telling me i think kurt kowarski was was telling me something really similar to that it's like you got to get the food in when you're in a bulk like that and you got to eat fast otherwise you'll get full too soon and you won't be able to get all your calories in yep so. yep that's really cool. Yeah, I don't know where I heard that. What I heard was 20 minutes and it starts once you smell the food. So you 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 can't be, you know, you got to have you got to go to the bathroom at the house. You can't be taking a leak when you get there. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's that's a valuable strategy right there. Well, cool, brother. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you being on the show. I I again, I feel like we could talk for multiple hours over and over and over again about various different stuff, but uh, I need to wind it up for the day. Anybody wants to find Jed, go search Jed Johnson on YouTube is the best way to find him. The grip authority.com is a fabulous resource for anybody that's interested in the, um, um, learning more about various aspects of the grip diesel crew.com slash store slash shop to sign up for the don't grip ask me why it's set up like that my web guy did that i had no idea i didn't even know how to get to my own store for a couple of weeks yeah and then i then i figured it out but that's that's just how it is slash that's store fine. slash that's fine it's i'll put it in as a live link in the show notes and people can click it and and go from there and um brother best of luck in the competition this upcoming weekend looking forward to seeing what the results are like appreciate you being on the show um everybody this is dave sure. whitley advancing man project podcast and that's all i got for you this time we'll see you next time